liver transplantation has come up, come on leaps and bounds and uh, i think it is also made its presence felt very well in india thanks to people like uh, rajiv in, i think bangalore is doing very well in terms of liver transplantation and i think it is only right that we have him as the moderator because i think it is uh, the subject is better dealt with by people who are doing it on a regular basis so i think the intricacies and the nuances and the exact indications troubleshooting all these things will be better explained by them so rajiv lochan is a uh, uh, you know consultant hepatobiliary and transplant surgeon at manipal hospitals he was previously in the uk uh, trained well at uh, newcastle i think and uh, you know i would i'm very grateful that he has agreed to be the moderator for this session and over to ainaz and thank you very much uh, rajiv i think there's the floor is over to both of you thank you thank you sir uh, liver transplantation is an important treatment option for patients with acute liver failure end stage disease and uh, primary hepatic malignancy uh, though uh, though it is not the initial or the primary treatment modality uh, like uh, transplantation will uh, infrequently it cures the underlying disease uh, rec uh, and uh, the recurrent li liver disease which occurs uh, in about 0 to 100% of the patients uh, post transplantation uh, depending on the disease for which the uh, transplantation was performed uh, so uh, the uh, the uh, american association for the study of liver disease has uh, developed uh, various guidelines regarding the indications for liver transplantation and evaluation for uh, patients being considered for liver transplant uh, well for the uh, like first going ahead with the indications for liver transplant uh, we have uh, acute liver failure uh, uh, patients with acute liver failure are given the highest priority for liver transplantation in the absence of uh, liver transplantation uh, the patients with acute liver failure will either uh, like uh, they, they have a 50% chance of either a, a, a complete recovery or a Uh, a very fifty uh, percent chance of uh, mortality. Uh, here, an acute liver failure is defined by the development of uh, uh, severe uh, acute liver injury uh, with uh, encephalopathy and impaired uh, synthetic function that is characterized by uh, the INR ratio uh, of more than one point five, and uh, in a patient without uh, cirrhosis or pre-existing liver disease, and uh, usually. Uh, uh, like uh, it can have uh, various uh, numerous causes of acute liver failure which can range from uh, drugs like uh, acet uh, acetaminophen and uh, hepatitis a hepatitis b uh, cryptogen cmv virus uh, the fa uh, acute fatty liver the race syndrome and genetic causes like wilson's disease uh, it can also be because of uh, hyperperfusion which is seen in case of ischemic hepatitis or sepsis uh, and uh, in uh, in cases of uh, infiltration by uh, tumor uh these are one of the few causes which uh, uh, which can lead to acute liver failure amongst these uh, viral and drug induced uh, hepatitis are one of the most common causes of uh, acute liver failure uh going to the second cause uh, cirrhosis uh, cirrhosis can uh, the presence of cirrhosis alone is not an indication for transplantation uh usually if the patient uh, tran is uh, pa transplantation is considered when there is a complication uh, associated with cirrhosis that is the patient is in a state of uh, decompensated liver cirrhosis which could include uh, uh, variceal bleeding ascites encephalopathy which are the primary manifestations of the of end stage liver disease and uh, these are considered to be the markers of decompensation and uh, the onset of decompensation significantly uh, it uh, causes an impairment in the survival of the uh, patient and therefore in these cases uh, you will consider uh, transplantation uh, there uh, there is a component of uh, compensated liver cirrhosis also so basically uh, when in uh, patients with cirrhosis are uh, were usually considered to be uh, a candidate for a liver transplantation once their merit score that is the model for uh, end stage liver disease is more than 15 uh, 
and uh, however there are a few uh, exceptions to these conditions these includes patients uh, who have uh, like in the exceptions in the sense that uh, they will be uh, exempted from the standard uh, meld uh, exception points these includes patients who have a uh, hepatopulmonary syndrome uh, uh, portopulmonary hypertension uh, like uh, primary uh, cystic fibrosis hilar uh, cholangiocarcinoma or in case of uh, hepatic artery thrombosis in these patients uh, they are ex uh, they do not qualify for the standard meld uh, points and these patients will be considered uh, for uh, li uh, liver transplantation as well uh, then uh, the third component is the acute and chronic uh, uh, liver uh, failure wherein there are uh, it is classified into type a type b and type c wherein type a is acute worsening of liver function in a patient who already has a uh, chronic liver disease type b is associated with acute decompensation in patients with cirrhosis and type c is a worsening of liver failure in decompensated cirrhotics uh, these are also considered to be uh, candidates for liver transplant however uh, uh, and the there is a the liver transplant is the only definitive uh, treatment for acclf however there are no guidelines which are existing regarding the selection criteria and most of these patients have some or the other underlying in, in uh, infection because of which uh, they are disqualified uh, from the uh, from receiving a liver transplant uh, 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 these are the criteria for acclf uh, uh, for the this is the like the melt score uh, system uh, wherein uh, you will be uh, seeing the uh, uh, you will be calculating the serum bilirubin the inr levels the sodium level creatinine level as well as the albumin level all of these will be taken into account to uh, get an uh, get a melt score and uh, melt score is mainly adopted in order to get a uh, uh, so as to prior get a prioritization how will you prioritize a patient on for a liver transplantation based on the uh, melt score uh, going ahead to hepatocellular carcinoma in uh, hepatocellular Hello? carcinoma Aina? yes sir hi hi see i think see uh, ravishankar sir has posted a few queries in the chat box which are quite relevant currently I don't know what the time schedule is. Maybe you would want to just, uh, you know, talk about that. And also, Srikanth has asked about what is HPS. Ravi Shankar sir, should we discuss now or should yeah, we yeah, talk yeah. at I the end? Think, yeah, I think you you should explain those things, I think, very. Yeah. Because, uh, after uh, the indications, you can tell. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so should I? Yeah, carry on. Talk about hepatocellular carcinoma. You are talking still about the indications for uh, transplant. Yes, right? sir. Yes, yeah. sir. Yes, sir. Uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, for uh, furthermore, there is a hepatocellular carcinoma. I, Inas, Inas, yes, sir. It is Milan criteria. It's not Milan's criteria because that means okay. Milan is a person. It is not Milan's. It is Milan is a city in uh, city. Italy. So it's Milan yes, criteria. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, yes, sir. So, uh, in terms of uh, Hepatocellular criteria, uh, we have uh, two criteria. One is the Milan criteria and the other one is the uh, UCSF uh, criteria. Uh, wherein in Milan criteria, we will look at a single nodule, uh, which is uh, like if there is a single tumor nodule less than uh, five centimeter, or if there are three tumor nodules of uh, less than uh, three centimeters. Uh, in addition to that, they there is no... Uh, vascular spread scene these are considered to be ideal candidates for uh, uh, like uh, this is considered uh, patients with such a manifestation are considered to be ideal candidates for liver transplantation uh, further there's the ucsf criteria wherein uh, if you have a single nodule of less than 6.5 centimeter or uh, less than three nodules which are uh, measuring less than 4.5 uh, centimeter and further, they have a total tumor diameter of less than 8 centimeter. These are also considered to be uh, falling in the category of uh, patients who are uh, like uh, who are in a, who can be taken up for uh, liver transplantation. Uh, then I, I think uh, um, yes. I think we'll ask Dr. Rajiv to you know, elaborate on this because I think this is very important. 
and i think also about the medal score the current standing of the medal score and things like that i think um, uh, rajiv uh, if i am right the milan criteria is much more rigid compared to ucsf and there are other two other criteria also i think and the other yes, two sir, yes, are much sir. more permissive much more permissive but they say yeah. that the the survival rates even though they have uh, been a, a bit more liberal the survival rates are kind of similar so yeah, yeah. kindly kindly elaborate on that yes sir so eh uh, i think that um, uh, you know can, can we just go to the go to the mel score uh, slide um, uh, you know ina so essentially what the mel score is and by the way the mel score was developed by um, you know a hepatologist of indian origin dr Patrick patrick kamath yeah patrick kamath he had come very recently and he keeps coming to bangalore and he is a student of bmc ravishankar sir knows about quite a bit about him because of his time in birmingham and his time in the river unit there um yeah. so see essentially the mel score is a score which was developed to look at survival after tips tips is a little procedure done for ascites but they figured out that you know this mel score which includes bilirubin inr uh, creatinine and also sodium where the mel sodium is actually much more discriminatory than mel score it gives an idea of survival of patients with decompensated liver disease so there is a sigmoid curve if you type the melt and survival you will see that there are certain cutoffs and 15 is currently taken as the cutoff mainly because the melt sodium of 15 because at a melt sodium of 15 you have a 3 month mortality of 10% and uh, you know between 6 to 10% where and liver transplant also has a mortality of 10% in the first 100 days so that is the cutoff at which the risk from medical management of decompensated liver disease equals the risk of surgically managed decompensated liver disease so any mel score below that the risk the survival is actually better compared to surgery that's why you don't do surgery so essentially in surgery whenever you are you know making a decision about a treatment option you look at the risk from that surgical procedure or treatment option the benefit from the treatment option and the alternative this is very important so what is the alternative to medical management it is transplant so it is only when transplant risk you know is going to be less than your medically managed risk you will opt for the lesser risk treatment so that is why this 15 is taken as a cutoff this again explains why you have meld exception points somebody might have a meld score of 10 but might have severe hps so hps is this one of these very see cirrhosis has various manifestations across the body and most of it involves vascular dilatation either the systemic vascular bed dilates and people develop low blood pressure systemic pooling capillary leak low albumin and then there's heptorenal syndrome and edema and ascites activation of renin angiotensin or they can develop pulmonary vasodilatation in certain parts of the pulmonary circulation causing a shunt so when there is a physiological inverted commas shunt and when there is a blood get shunted across from right to left without getting oxygenated the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood falls and people become breathless so this is demonstrate you know this happens you know without any relationship to the severity of liver cirrhosis so your mel score might be 10 and if you calculate your mel score your risk to life is only 5% you know so you would you, but because of hps the saturation is very low and patient is not able to walk and if he runs or tries to exert himself patient might have a cardiorespiratory arrest develop cyanosis breathlessness you know and all this can happen so this is one example of hps causing you know that is why you are given melt exception points means to say that the patient is an exception to melt that's what it means so these people are given a beginning melt score of 22 now i'll come to why the mel score see mel score probably does not apply to india see the mel score was developed in countries where the average donation you know liver availability was 10 per million you know organ donation rate in india it is 0.1 to 0.5 so the mel score was developed for a certain system where there is a particular weightless mortality so this is all a bit more you know yeah yeah so a bit more gray for for the sake of indications we can take it as 15 um, you know and and these are the meld exception points 
and how the melt sodium is better than uh, the melt itself. Now, HCC is another melt exception point because somebody can have, you know, your HCC within Milan criteria. You know, three nodules, each nodule three centimeter, you know, and none more than five centimeters. And uh, so this this comes under your BCLC early HCC classification, multi-nodular, you know, early A, you know, A, BCLC A. So, th but still the melt score can be low, but because of the HCC, their, you know, survival is actually, you know, if un uh, left untreated, the survival is not more than a few months. So even these people are given melt exception points. So this is one way of prioritizing. So yeah. there is a difference between indication for surgery and prioritizing people because you have a limited resource. Because if there is one liver organ available, see anybody more than 15 is suitable for a transplant. You know, so the male score goes from 15 to 40. So who are you going to give this liver to? Yeah. So there is a little subtle difference there between prioritizing people on a transplant list and indication. So for indication, anybody more than 15 is okay. And meld exception points is a concept to understand. And and uh, and the HCC have certain, you know, uniqueness to them. And yes, Milan is very restrictive because there are criteria which is called up to seven criteria is there. That's another criteria. You know, you can transplant with people up to seven nodules in the liver and still get the same survival as 70% five-year survival. And by the way, HCC is one of the, you know, most important apogee cancers for which surgery gives you a 70% five-year survival. Your pancreatic cancer, stomach, apart from some very early stomach cancers and esophageal cancer do not give that to you. So HCC is a very eminently uh, uh, treatable upper GI tumor uh, from a transplant point of view. And in fact, transplant oncology is becoming a big, big field in surgical oncology in the days to come. So I'll just leave it here. If there's any questions, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I'd be happy to answer. Yeah, I think, yeah, carry on, uh, Inas. What about patient with cirrhosis going for malignancy? Yes, sir. See, uh, absolutely. I think, see, HCC by and large will occur in a diseased liver. It's very rare for HCC to, do, HCC to occur in a normal liver. So this is something very important. But there is a difference between cirrhosis, fibrosis, and fatty change, and fatty change with inflammation. So there can be steatosis only, steatohepatitis, fibrosis of varying grades, and cirrhosis. So cirrhosis is very obvious. But the remaining forms of chronic liver disease, we can't really pick up on imaging. The labs are very subtle. And of course, there are other tests which we can do to pick up chronic liver disease. But by and large, HCC will occur in a liver which is already has some damage. So, so that's important. So HCC generally occurs in cirrhosis only. And even for that, uh, the survival is 70% uh, at five years for somebody in early A, Milan or UCSF or in certain selected up to seven when treated by transplant. Okay, carry on, Minas. Yes, sir. Any questions? Any questions? Anybody else? Okay, carry on. Yes, sir. Uh, for the uh, contraindications to... Uh, repeat, uh, repeat the use of secretary. Uh, so... Uh, if there is a single uh, nodule of less than 6.5 centimeter or less than three nodules wherein uh, the, the diameter, the total tumor diameter is less than eight centimeter and um, uh, the nodules uh, have a diameter of less than 4.5 centimeter, the, those are the candidates which are considered to uh, for uh, liver transplantation, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, for the, uh, going to the contraindications of uh, liver transplantation, the absolute contraindication includes uh, melt scores of less than fif uh, 15. If they have an advanced uh, cardio cardiac or pulmonary disease, patients uh, suffering from AIDS, active alcohol or uh, substance abuse, uh, illicit substance abuse. Uh, further, uh, if the patient has a, a septic shock, uh, is in septic shock or sepsis, and uh, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma uh, and uh, fulminant hepatic failure, wherein the uh, intracranial pressure is above uh, 50 mm of mercury. Uh, and also, if there is uh, like a severe psychological disease, uh, 
the relative contraindications can include general debility, persistent non-compliance, advanced uh, age, and extensive portal or mesenteric uh, thrombosis. Uh, going uh, ahead to pre-transplant uh, evaluation, uh, we uh, so uh, you will have laboratory testings that should be obtained, uh, which will include uh, uh, the uh, blood grouping, blood typing, the liver liver function tests, uh, including the enzyme uh, titers, uh, your routine investigations of CBC, RFT, along with that, your serologies for uh, viruses like hepatitis A, B, uh, A, B, C, then uh, cytomegalovirus, the uh, HIV, Epstein-Barr virus, and uh, even uh, uh, this uh, varicella, uh, and uh, urine al analysis. Uh, there'll be cardiopulmonary evaluation uh, in terms of uh, ECG, uh, doing an ECG or cardiac stress testing to screen for any co co existing coronary artery disease, uh, echocardiography and uh, pulse oximetry to screen for uh, hepatopulmonary syndrome as well. Uh, you will also additionally test for uh, pulmonary uh, diseases to basically you uh, use the pulmonary function test so as to analyze the uh, for any evidence of hepatopulmonary syndrome uh, cancer screening uh, should be looked at by uh, the, the with the aid of radiological investigations like uh, uh, ct and mri scanning and uh, uh, like uh, these patients should also be screened for uh, colorectal cancer uh, especially patients who are above 45 years of age and uh, other than that uh, screening of uh, cervical breast or prostate cancer should be obtained uh, depending on the uh, patient's uh, age uh, criteria uh, infectious disease evaluation and vaccination should also be looked at uh, so uh, when in you will be looking at uh, uh, other diseases like uh, any uh, for like tuberculosis and in endemic areas you can also consider uh, diseases like uh, strongyloids or uh, uh, cocidomycosis uh, there are various vaccinations uh, that are uh, recommended prior to liver transplantation which will include uh, uh, pneumococcus uh, influenza uh, dpt vaccinations hepatitis a and b uh, vaccination all of these should be taken into con uh, consideration uh, furthermore there is uh, also a uh, uh, psychosocial evaluation and education which is an important criteria which should be taken into uh, account before uh, take, uh, considering a patient for uh, liver transplantation uh, the pre-transplant evaluations, as mentioned the laboratory testing the cardiopulmonary evaluation cancer screening uh, infectious disease evaluation, the psychosocial evaluations and other testings, which will include the bone density scan and upper GI endoscopy for uh, if in, there is any indications of uh, cirrhosis or portal hypertension. Uh, going ahead to types of liver transplant, uh, we have uh, the, uh, the uh, there are the disease donor transplantations, living donor transplantation and uh, split liver transplantation. Uh, in diseased uh, donor trans uh, do donor transplantation, optimal disease donors are generally uh, they are young patients, previously healthy individuals who have developed a fatal brain injury, which could be because of a uh, uh, head trauma, intracerebral hemorrhage, or anoxia. And uh, furthermore, we will there will be donor evaluation that includes a uh, donation after brain death. Uh, the initial this is the initial evaluation which is uh, typically performed and uh, here the uh, potential donors with contraindications are excluded and uh, further the uh, uh, also uh, further the living donors uh, like uh, you will also be evaluating the living donors for their uh, contraindications uh, the donor factors which will be impacting the recipient outcomes will uh, include the age of the patient older age uh, like older age is you uh, usually have more initial dysfunction because of ischemia or uh, uh, previous injury and uh, 
therefore uh, one of this is a criteria the other is hepatic uh, steatosis wherein uh, donor livers that appear to be fatty on inspection should be biopsied for uh, examination to determine the fat content and if there is severe macro uh, like severe steatosis then this is associated with the primary non function and this should be taken into account before considering uh, that organ for transplant uh, hypernatremia uh, the uh, in liver transplant recipients who receive grafts from donors who have had hypernatremia uh, will worsen the uh, outcome of liver transplantation so uh, this should also be taken into uh, an account uh, because this may be associated with uh, uh, fact uh, the, this is one of the factor which can affect the graft function hemodynamic instability uh, uh, usually the hepatic blood flow will decrease with periods of hypotension and because of use of uh, uh, high dose of vasopressors this will predispose the liver to ischemic uh, liver injury therefore this is one of the factors which again should be con uh, considered uh, donor recipient mismatch uh, wherein uh, the gender the transplantation of liver from a female donors is uh, usually associated with a worse outcome uh, in comparison to the others and uh, the, there are some studies which have also suggested that uh, gender mismatch transplants are asso uh, associated with uh, particularly more problems in comparison to the same gender transplant. Uh, ABO compatibility, again, is one of the important factors which has to be taken into consideration before uh, the, the taking up the uh, take, taking up the patient for uh, liver trans uh, the transplantation. Uh, and in technical factors, we have the uh, cold ischemia time, wherein uh, prolonged cold ischemia time, that is more than 12 hours, will impact the donor's organs viability and the graft survival. Uh, so, uh, therefore, uh, this is uh, the cold ischemia time should also be taken into consideration because cold preservation leads to liver injury over time. Yes, uh, I know, I yes, know, sir. Just, just talk. yes, sir. Um, we'll ask uh, Nikita or Praveen, do you know the difference between warm ischemia and cold ischemia? What is the difference and what is the significance? Hello? No, sir. You don't know? Don't know, sir. Didn't come across that. Transplant, you have not come across warm ischemia and cold ischemia? Just, no, think, of, just think about it, Nikita. What does it mean in terms of self-explanatory? Don't say I don't know. Just think about it. You have taken out the donor liver. And what do you do with it? So, so usually we put it in an uh, ice... Uh, like okay. ice so, uh, right. So that's cold ischemia, isn't it? You perfuse yes, it sir. with a solution. That's a cold ischemia time. If you don't do it and leave it on the table, it get dried up and yeah, but that's warm ischemia. It, it survives much okay. shorter. In very simple terms. I'm simplifying the whole thing. It, it, it just dies. I mean, it, it its survival is much much shorter. Cold ischemia time is usually longer. That's all there is to it. Go ahead, Ainas. Yeah. The reason I I interjected was for you guys to think about it many times. And yeah. if you make a mistake, it doesn't matter. Just think. Okay. Yeah. Uh, when we are take, uh, considering deceased uh, uh, liver uh, liver donors, you uh, also have approaches to expand uh, donor liver supply, wherein uh, there is a uh, there's this criteria of donation after circulatory death. So patients with an irreversible illness, uh, as which serve as a non heart beating donors, are uh, or after withdrawal of care in a, the hospital setting and. Uh, and after achieving a criteria, set criteria for cardiac death, such donation is referred to as donation after circulatory death. And uh, again, these patients, uh, this can be considered, uh, uh, the uh, DCD donor livers can be considered uh, for uh, uh, liver, uh, for the uh, transplantation. Uh, then uh, you have uh, the hepatitis C virus positive donors and uh, hepatitis uh, B virus positive donors, again, which can be considered uh, for uh, liver transplantation. Uh, further, the uh, machine liver perfusion and uh, 
that so there are two types there is this uh, hypothermic uh, oxygenated perfusion and one uh, ex vivo machine perfusion uh, the the these two have been considered uh, to uh, basically uh, enable the liver to be uh, transplanted um, more uh, there are further there, there is a drawback of these that uh, the machine liver perfusion is associated with uh, effects of uh, uh, cold ischemia and uh, and affecting the gra the graphs adversely uh, you I also i know yes, just stop will uh, request dr rajiv to just elaborate on the you know, university of wisconsin solution the perfusion is there anything new about perfusion i think pulse perfusion lots of things are there i think let him just elaborate on that yes. because it is important yeah. Rajiv, yes. Rajiv, yes. Uh, can can you okay, tell sir. us a little? Can you tell us a little bit more about this donation after circulatory death? I don't understand it completely myself. Yeah. Please, yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I think so. See, essentially, this whole idea. See, the very first transplant which were done, kidneys and livers were done after uh, you know the standard concept of death. The current standard concept of death. which we all know i mean leaving alone the transplant uh, uh, you know field is when the heart stops so this is circulatory death as we all know the problem with circulatory death is as soon as the uh, circulation stops we were just talking about it you know warm ischemia starts in the organs and after some period of time irreversible cell swelling and death occurs to actually you know many minutes sometimes it can be 10 15 20 minutes also depending upon the circumstance so the initial the transplants kidney transplants were circulatory dead donors now after some time for various problems history of transplant is very fascinating for some reason mainly because we did not understand immunosuppression technical aspects were solved some patients began to have you know joseph mare was given the nobel prize for the you know identical twin transplants and that was a living donor transplant and there was no immunological problems so that's why the transplant was successful but for a very long period of time transplant were not successful because of immunological problems and also this problem of warm ischemia so when motor cars became to be used quite frequently in the west there was no concept of seat belts at the time people would have head injuries and also cervical neck fractures and base of skull fractures with whiplash injuries and head hitting the steering board and lot of people used to die then ford company introduced seat belts and people with devastating injuries survived long enough to come to hospital so this is when the whole idea then people realized that people's brains were damaged but the other organs could be kept beating because of the iron lung which was invented during the pneumonia epidemic you know the flu pneumonia epidemic in the 2030 uh, 1920s and 30s so then people realized and doctors realized that brain death was a concept and in brain death what happens is the circulation is intact you put a cannula into the aorta and you isolate the circulation of whichever organ you want to harvest and you put in cold fluid so there is no initial warm ischemia and people thought that they have conquered everything and everything was fine but the problem is cold ischemia continues to damage organs as well we know that there is a, i mean there is a lot of beautiful you know physiology involved in all this i won't go into detail and once you take the liver out of the cold circulation and there is a certain period of time where you connect the arteries and veins because you can't connect it immediately so this period of time is called the warm ischemia so this ischemia cold ischemia warm ischemia causes damage to the organ which is called reperfusion injury and reperfusion injury is one of the biggest problems of graft dysfunction whatever graft it is it can be it can be uh, kidney heart pancreas liver whatever you know lung now to overcome this problem people came up with lot of buffered solutions and uw which is the university of wisconsin solution is a buffered solution which maintains a ph and an osmolality which is very very similar to that of plasma and it contains mannitol riboflavin some glucose some potassium magnesium you know and basically the milieu is supposed to be as close to you know intracellular milieu of the cell to prevent cell swelling and passage of sodium across the cell membrane so that's the whole idea but it is an artificial solution and the ischemia reperfusion problem has never been solved 
so to overcome the problems of cold perfusion is how machine perfusion recently has sort of you know taken on because of development of you know uh, small min miniaturized uh, pumps very good very small caliber tubings and the ability of electronic circuits to maintain pulsatile blood flow outside the body so basically you're trying to create if you take the liver you give the liver you know you, you connect a um, you know a, a pump to the portal vein you connect a pump to the artery and you circulate cross match leukocyte depleted blood you know into the liver through a pump and then you measure measure the acid and the ph of the blood and the initial few hours you adjust it so that the liver continues to work and the liver actually clears lactate makes glycogen you know does glycolysis and you can give tpn to the liver so you can keep the liver alive and also help it you know overcome the effects of or repair the effects of brain death and circular and cytokine storm so basically when brain death happens there's a lot of you know sympathetic uh, you know you know discharge across the body and there's a lot of tachycardia vasoconstriction and then subsequently vasodilatation all this causes damage to organs all this is supposed to be ameliorated by machine perfusion it's a fantastic field in liver transplant it which is developed over the past 10 15 years and lot of various variations are there so i won't go into all the details now circulatory death going back to circulatory death see there is a lot of confusion even amongst intensivists and neurosurgeons and uh, you know about this brain death concept i mean even in india there are if you look at the media there's a person called kb ganapati there are various cases in the supreme court and in kerala for example you know people are completely against that state used to have lot of organ donations but now there is zero donation there because the you know there is a mass hysteria which is spread saying that this whole concept of brain death is alien and again lot of resistance among the medical community as well and more importantly for families it is easier to accept circulatory death now how are you going to make an organ which you retrieve from a patient who is in the traditional way dead basically what should happen is you know we should be able to predict in whom when you withdraw life support the heart is going to stop and take consent from the family beforehand and there is a period in that time you know which which is called the agonal period when you withdraw care from a patient and from that time of withdrawal of care to the heart stopping if it is within certain times you know for liver it is around about 30 minutes and uh, you know if the patient's heart stops within that time you immediately cannulate the aorta this is so this is where you have two warm time actually so this is you have the time from when the heart stops to when you are able to cannulate the aorta do a cut on the tummy can put a cannula into the aorta this takes around about 2 to 3 minutes and then clamp the supraceliac aorta and flush the you know uh, aorta with cold fluid so this takes around about 3 to 5 minutes sometimes up to 10 minutes this is called the first warm time and then you harvest the liver or any organ uh, kidney whatever even heart also although the technique is a bit more complicated then you put the organ in cold fluid or you put it on the normothermic machine perfusion and then you take the liver off the machine and then you you know do all your vascular anastomosis so this is the second warm ischemia so the sole concept of cardiac death and donation after circulatory death has come about for two reasons one is the number of brain dead individuals in the west i mean in india it is still the donation rate is very very poor we have not even reached saturation level traffic accident you know the ability to revive patients from horrendous traffic accidents and very bad cardio you know cerebrovascular accidents is increasing so they are able to get the patient back and they they are able to keep the patient alive and the patient is not really brain dead but the chance of him or her surviving to fruitful life is very very less so this is where withdrawal of care has come in for example patients with motor motor neuron disease they are surviving longer and longer on home ventilators and things myasthenia gravis are are surviving longer you know copd patients are surviving on you know home oxygen therapy this is all in the west and again there is you know lot of drug use has increased in the west and there are out of hospital cardiac arrest and then there is a phone in for a cardiac arrest and a young patient who suffered a cardiac arrest by asphyxia or aspiration is revived and brought to the emergency but then has suffered irreversible damage to the brain but is not brain dead but is in a vegetative state and this person there is no hope of him ever surviving to uh, long term uh, fruitful life 
So these are the patients in which withdrawal of life-sustaining treatment, LST, withdrawal of life-sustaining treatment is authorized. And also, some people also give written directives saying that, no, in case this happens to me, I've got motor neuron disease, I don't want to be resuscitated, and you please withdraw care for me. All this is called advanced directive, living wills. All these concepts are coming into India now newly. In fact, the government has very recently, I will share it on the group, uh, you know, there is a document which is out uh, from the Supreme Court and from the government for public consultation. The consultation is going to run until the 20th of October, and they've invited views from public and from experts on this proposed, you see, in India, we still can't withdraw life, uh, you know, withdraw life support. If suppose a patient is on life supportive treatment, it is illegal in India to actually withdraw life support. So that is why we have this concept of Dharma. You all would have come across it, where the, we, we say that the, because the patient asked, we sent the patient and then the ventilator is taken off. So, I mean, this is kind of, you know, I mean, there's a lot of ethical, legal and moral uh, discussions on that. We'll not go into that. So this is circular, donation after circulatory death. And because of this, the available organ pool in the West has nearly tripled. And life supportive, uh, you know, transplants are increasing in number. There are other problems of circulatory dead organs donated. I will not go into that in detail. A very, very fascinating aspect. And machine perfusion is able to revive the damage caused by the first warm ischemia. So that is why the machines were came, you know, came in actually. In most transplant conferences now, talk is a lot about machines. It also has living donors, but it, it was primarily used for the first warm ischemia. You know, the time when the heart stops, to when the organ is retrieved. Those few minutes, the the damage which the organ is undergoing because of sludging, hypoxia, microcirculatory clogging with RBCs and platelet activation, all that is reversed by machine perfusion. So I'll stop here. Yeah. You know, I've and gone on for long. Just, yeah, now, what about this hepatitis B and C positive donors? Is, is that C, not a problem? Sir, sir, hepatitis C donors are not a problem now, sir, because we have very strong and very effective, yeah, direct acting antivirals. We can treat it. We can treat it in the in the recipient. Although we prefer that the recipient also has hepatitis C, but in case somebody is very sick and is can't wait for a hepatitis C negative donor, and and provided the patient is counselled about hepatitis C, because a very small number of patients can become resistant to the direct acting antivirals. So hepatitis C virus positive donors are not really, even RNA positive donors are not really a contraindication. However, hepatitis B virus positive donors is a different story. We have not still not been able to cure hepatitis B. Okay. Hepatitis C we can cure. So okay. hepatitis B core positive donors can still be accepted who are anti-HBS positive. So core positive donors means basically you have the antibody against the core antigen yeah. and also have the antibody against the surface antigen. Yeah. These, these people can be used hepatitis B surface antigen positive donors is still not a good idea, not good idea. And, and, and not a good idea and certainly for living donor also would not use and um, you know we would not use in disease donor also although in some exceptional situations the problem with HPSAG positive donors is that you know occult liver damage quite a lot is there whereas total HBC Core antibody positive donors, we still we can take. Yeah. Okay. Ainas, continue. Yes. Uh, further on evaluating evaluation of the living uh, donor candidate, uh, you uh, will also uh, have to look into the uh, again the blood typing and cross matching, the medical evaluation which will include the cardiopulmonary evaluation and further uh, laboratory screening uh, tests and. Uh, uh, then uh, psychosocial evaluation uh, is again an important uh, performance which uh, should be done uh, like prior to donation and uh, it should uh, also uh, include screening for any psychosocial issues, uh, any uh, mental health issues which might com complicate the living donor's recovery and uh, the uh, uh, furthermore uh, there is this uh, uh, criteria of uh, independent uh, living donor uh, advocate that requires that the living uh, donor uh, uh, recovery hospitals must uh, designate and provide each donor candidate with a person uh, who is uh, basically uh, not involved in the recipient uh, uh, in this process of uh, recipient evaluation and uh, is independent of the decision to the 
uh, uh, to the process of transplant and uh, this uh, advocate must have uh, uh, adequate qualifications and uh, training requirement regarding the knowledge of uh, living organ donation transplant uh, medical uh, ethics and informed content consents and the impact which uh, the way the uh, that uh, living donor's life is going to be affected and uh, or he should also be screening for any uh, external pressure on the living donor's decision about whether to donate or not. Uh, further, uh, you also have uh, to evaluate for uh, uh, criteria like the age, wherein age less than 18 and more than uh, age more than 60 years is considered to be a contraindication to uh, donating liver uh, further uh, the con uh, in inability to provide an informed uh, consent that is that the patient has a lack of a descending uh, decision making capacity uh, bmi of more than uh, 30 to 35 kgs uh, per, per meter square any signs of any active infection or active malignancy or incompletely treated malignancy uh, hypercoagulant coagulable disorders and other disorders like alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, uh, prior history of liver donation, uh, high uh, uh, if there's a high suspicion of uh, coercion, uh, all of these factors are considered uh, in the evaluation of a living liver donor candidate. And these are considered to be the uh, con uh, contraindications for liver donation. Uh, going to the, uh, this, the brief overview of the technique, uh, in uh, the general principles, you will look at the donor liver size. The donor must have a sufficient liver size for to allow for uh, donation of adequate volume of the liver to the recipient. And there should, while maintaining an adequate uh, uh, FLR, that is the uh, future liver remnant, resecting less than 70% of the donor liver volume is usually uh, acceptable. And uh, this will consist of uh, the patient having an FLR of more than 30% of the original uh, liver volume. The second principle that you look at is, look at is the graph to recipient uh, weight ratio, wherein uh, you, uh, you have to determine a minimum uh, allograph size which will be provided for the recipient with adequate liver function based on the recipient's weight. And uh, like uh, the this uh, the graph to recipient weight ratio of more than 0.8 percent has been associated with a uh, with an adequate safety and adequate uh, liver function for the recipient. And uh, uh, although uh, like uh, uh, lower GR uh, like this uh, graph to recipient weight ratios of lo as low as 0.6 percent have also been uh, used for in selected cases. Uh, in donor hepatectomy, uh, the left or right lobe of the liver can be used for transplantation depending upon the anatomical consideration, the volume of the donor liver and the size of the uh, recipient. Uh, also, uh, further, uh, you, uh, you, depending on that, you will go ahead with the specific resection techniques. Uh, uh, recipient operations, uh, the recipient operation will have a recipient hepatectomy, wherein the uh, usually the first portion of the recipient operation is the uh, recipient hepatectomy uh, wherein uh, you will be preparing the liver allograph for implantation uh, which will involve reconstruction of the hepatic vein uh, and uh, usually uh, you use uh, the uh, the reconstruction is done in such a way to op optimize the venous outflow uh, um, the Middle hepatic vein branches of more than 5 mm in diameter should be reconstructed in order to maximize the venous outflow of the graft. And uh, this is more commonly performed with a right lobe uh, donor graft. And uh, further, uh, there is also the pre preparation of the bile duct anastomosis. And uh, usually uh, in this, you will have... Uh, to connect the donor bile duct to the recipient uh, common bile duct. And uh, uh, there may be... Uh, this, the, there's this procedure wherein you will perform a RUNY hepatico jejunostomy reconstruction, uh, which will uh, enable us in uh, achieving an adequate anastomosis. And uh, in terms of the implantation step, the first step in implantation of the graft is the uh, venous outflow reconstruction. And uh, uh, in this, the reconstruction, uh, you reconstruct the main outflow, which could be the right hepatic vein or left uh, middle hepatic vein confluence in an end-to-side fashion to the uh, recipient vena cava. And uh, 
the portal vein inflow uh, is the second step in implantation uh, for the portal vein uh, uh, to is basically you are create there is the creation of the portal vein anastomosis which is typically an end to end anastomosis uh, the arterial inflow is uh, uh, the arterial anastomosis is usually again in an end to end uh, fashion and again the way uh, we explain biliary reconstruction will be the last anastomosis which is done which is done in a uh, do and by uh, hepatic jejunostomy which is an end to end anastomosis uh, between the uh, to the uh, recipient common bile duct uh, going to the outcomes of uh, this uh, you will just, have just a minute, I yes have... sir we'll yes, just sir. ask rajiv is there anything technically he wants to add rajiv one uh, very basic question yes sir Hello. See the yes, we know the concept of the donor hepatectomy where you can you know living donor hepatectomy. But when yes. you when you talk about the you know the cadaver uh, hepatectomy, uh, this one donor or whatever, uh, yes, is sir. it a common practice to split the liver and give it to two people or is it you know how what is the criteria? Sir, basically to split a liver, the liver has to be really really of good quality. Yeah. So I think I think I think I think this is extremely important. Now the problem is that you know most livers that we get here in here in India, why in India across the world as well, is only a small proportion of them are actually suitable for splitting. Now yeah. the basically the 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 uh, the conditions to split um, you know uh, a a donor liver are generally your donor should be young should be should have stayed in the icu for less than 7 days should not be on any inotropes lft should be plumb normal normal means ast should be 20 the normal value of ast that we see 40 in the lab that is wrong actually the normal ast value in a young female which is the standard according to asld is 18 to 20 and males it is 24 so the inotrope you know ast lt value should not be more than two times normal no inotropes and very short stay in ICU, and we need to know the liver volume. Now, yeah. also, the liver can be split in two ways. Liver can be split as a left lateral and an extended right graft, yeah. or it can be split as an extended left graft and a posterior sector graft, yeah. or it can be split as a right-left graft. Now, yeah. right-left graft splitting is not really that very advisable because you end up dividing a liver half and half, with cold time and various other things, and neither recipient is actually gets benefit. And if because neither uh, both the liver half can't be given to two adults, so general practice is to give the extended right graft for an adult and the left left or lateral graft for a small baby okay. or infant. Now, because the split livers have become are so rare to come by in India, for example, if you look in Karnataka, on average we have round about one disease donor graft which is suitable for splitting per year. In Karnataka, we have around about 60 to 80, 90 uh, disease donor transplants happening of which maybe 30, 40, half of the organs are marginal organs. Means the mm -hmm. fat is more than 30%, patient is on multiple inotropes, extremes of age and, for, and it is unit policy whether we accept marginal grafts or not. We don't accept marginal grafts because in India, I mean, we are not the West we can't have a patient in ICU with graft dysfunction, lingering for many days, and then having another transplant. In other places, insurance or the government pays for it for multiple transplants, and, and all these types of risks can be taken. But in India, we can't. So yeah. if you look at it, there is only 40 good quality, non-marginal, uh, you know, the cadaver grafts available in Karnataka, and out of that, maybe one is suitable for splitting the liver. Now, it is because, but whereas in UK, for example, the, I know about UK, UNOS also has a system. UNOS is the regulatory authority for the US. In the UK, what happens is there are some criteria which say that is the graft splittable. If the graft is splittable, it is offered to one of three pediatric transplant centers and the pediatric surgeon will come, the pediatric liver transplant surgeon will come for the retrieval and they will decide whether you're going to split the liver inside the donor or you're going to take the liver out, bring it to the unit and then split it. So splitting the liver in the donor is much better, but the logistics are all much more complicated and the OT occupancy time in the donor hospital is long. So a lot of logistical problems are there, but splitting the liver 
sounds easy, but it's not that very easy. Number of grass available are difficult. Logistics is difficult. It is because of this problem that living donor transplants came about. So Charles Brolsch did the first transplant. Living donor transplants happened in a child. You know, uh, Russell Strong did it in Australia. Brolsch did it in America. Nearly simultaneously, when parents donated the left lateral segment of their liver with very low risk, but unfortunately or fortunately, this living donor operation is being pushed to the extremes. And very recently, we've had a problem as well. So we need to remember that, you know, living donor operations, although, although they sound, uh, you know, I mean, they're nice to do, they're technically complex, and it's nice to see the graft in another person, saving another person's life. But we need to remember that it's a very complicated operation. So splitting the liver, uh, the problem with spreading the liver is what gave rise to living donor transplant. You know, to, uh, to to so so the history of transplant, one thing has led to another, led to another. Yeah. Okay, Venus, carry on. Why why venous anastomosis first? Uh, uh, okay, so basically, sir, whenever we do transplant, the outflow is the most important one to do. Uh, number one, and in liver outflow is. Because if you do the portal vein and artery first, doing the outflow becomes very difficult. So it is a matter of ease that you do the outflow first. Because when you put the graft in, so I've actually put a link in the chat box. It is the Toronto Video Atlas. I think this is a beautiful video atlas. I would urge everybody to see it. And even we see it. A lot of complicated operations are there. There are a lot of HPB operations also. Uh, so it is 3D animation, which is superimposed on uh, real-life patients and real-life CT scans. So if, when you put a liver into the patient, the posterior most organ uh, you know, structure is the, is the vena cava, and you do that first, and then you keep working posterior to anterior. Because if you do the bile duct, artery, and portal vein first, doing the outflow becomes very difficult. Very difficult, yeah. Yeah. Okay, Aynas, carry on. Yes, sir. Uh, going to the outcomes, in for recipient outcomes, the, usually the survival, the graft survival rate is uh, uh, shown to be the one year survival rate is assumed to be around uh, 81%. And uh, further, uh, the adverse effects associated with uh, uh, in recipients uh, will be uh, this is this condition of small for size syndrome, wherein uh, it is related to a partial liver graft that is too small to meet the metabolic dis demands of the uh, recip uh, recipient. And uh, this will manifest by uh, post the post-op day seven, which will show uh, a derangement in the uh, liver, uh, liver function test, uh, such as an elevated uh, total bilirubin level or the, uh, an increased INR level. Uh, there can also be associated vascular complications such as hepatic artery thrombosis or portal vein thrombosis. Uh, bilirubin complications in terms of bile leak is the most uh, common uh, complication which often occurs uh, from the cut surface of the uh, liver. Uh, the donor outcome, uh, the general recovery of the uh, donor is uh, usually uh, well. And uh, usually uh, the typical length of stay uh, in the hospital is uh, ranging from four to seven days. And uh, most of the liver regeneration occurs within the first two weeks of uh, after donation, and uh, the it is seen that uh, like the do, the regeneration is about eighty four to ninety two percent of its original uh, volume by six uh, by the end of six months. The adverse effects are, are relatively less, but they can be seen in term, like uh, in, which includes bile leaks or surgical site infection, and. Uh, uh, these are one of the complications uh, which can adverse effects which can be associated with the uh, donor outcomes uh, going to the uh, immunosuppression uh, immunosuppression uh, can be uh, so you have uh, the initial uh, therapy wherein you will uh, use an initial regimen which is consisting of uh, glucocorticoids calcineurin and then uh, anti metabolite uh, glucocorticoids are uh, usually uh, the commonly used, uh, wherein uh, usually methylprednisolone is uh, administered to begin with uh, uh, 
like uh, 1000 uh, mg intravenous intraoperatively is given followed by uh, four days of gradually decreasing the dose and then trans uh, like uh, doing the transition to oral prednisolone and uh, you usually uh, gradually taper this dose uh, and discontinue uh, glucocorticoids by the end of uh, 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 six months post uh, transplant uh, then uh, you all the calcineurin inhibitors are uh, uh, used usually to, we typically use the uh, tacrolimus uh, it inhibits uh, interleukin uh, 2 and interferon uh, gamma production and it is a potent drug uh, the dosing and administration uh, keeps on varying uh, but you need to make sure that there is no kidney imp uh, impairment and after that you start with a low dose of uh, 2 mg uh, every 12 hours on uh, post op day 1 and then uh, you the basically give a, a rough uh, level of around 8 to 12 nanograms per ml by the end of first week of post uh, transplant in case of uh, uh, patients who have a uh, kidney impairment, you can consider using an uh, alternate uh, agent, uh, which is uh, like a, a bas uh, basiliximab, which can also be used uh, for uh, administration. Uh, cyclosporin is again an alternative, which can be used in uh, uh, this uh, uh, patients who are showing uh, toxicity for uh, tacrolimus. And uh, there Again, uh, you'll have uh, dosing, which can be uh, typically you can start from one to two milligram per kg every uh, 12 hours. And uh, you will, uh, uh, the monitoring should be uh, done uh, at a regular schedule at an immediate post transplant period of hospitalization after uh, following a hospital discharge uh, so that you achieve a target drug level goal. And uh, again, uh, after you achieve a stable dose, uh, then uh, weekly uh, levels for one month can be monitored. Uh, the adverse effects usually associated with them, uh, both tacrolimus and cyclosporin are similar and include nephrotoxicity, uh, hypertension, hyperkalemia, uh, and even uh, neurological toxi uh, toxicity. Uh, the anti-metabolite agents will include uh, drugs like uh, mycophenolate, and uh, azathioprine, uh, my, um, the, they are usually used for preventing rejection in transplant patients. And again, uh, you administer it at a dose of one gram uh, every 12 hours. Uh, and uh, further, uh, azathioprine is uh, typically given at a dose of around 1.5 to 2 milligram per kg uh, daily. And the maximum dose that can be uh, given is up to uh, 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 it's uh, you, uh, uh, I think 200 milligrams. Uh, 200 milligrams daily is the maximum dose ca that can be given, and uh, the uh, you can also use. Uh, so after this, you have the maintenance therapy, wherein you can also use uh, mTOR in, uh, inhibitors, in, uh, which includes everlimus and uh, serolimus as the drugs, and uh, they will uh, uh, basically uh, the dosing for this will include. Uh, uh, one milligram twice a day to achieve a target uh, level of around uh, six nanogram per ml. And uh, for serolimus, you start with an initial dose of uh, one to two milligram a day. Here, you will have to monitor the CBC, the electrolytes, uh, and again, the renal, the basic uh, routine investigations. And uh, you can, uh, you also, uh, this is associated with uh, nephrotoxicity. So uh, again, uh, you can, uh, you will also have to monitor the serum creatinine and protein to creat ratio uh, at uh, baseline one month, six month, and uh, yearly after that. Uh, further, uh, there are other adverse effects which can associated with it, which could include uh, bone marrow suppression, uh, uh, pneumonia, hyperlipidemia, which is also seen with uh, mTOR inhibitors. Uh, you, uh, Anas, Anas, can you yes, go sir. back a slide? Can you almost uh, slide? Yeah. What did you yes, mean by saying donor liver supply? Sir, the sir I the I like the box came wrong, sir. Like okay, uh, fine, when I fine. was making the chart. Yeah, no yes, sir. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, go on. Yes, yeah. sir. Yes. Uh, uh, then uh, there is the pathophysiology, uh, acute rejection of uh, liver failure, wherein you have the pathophysiology of acute rejection, which will occur in uh, four uh, four phases, wherein you have the uh, alloantigen recognition, 
uh, which is the signal one, uh, wherein there will be a presentation of a foreign allo antigen along with the uh, the uh, host uh, histocompatibility complex. The second will be the lymphocyte activation, wherein the T cell activation uh, will cause co-stimulation and will it will bind to a variety of T cell receptors uh, and further uh, initiate lympho uh, lymphocyte activation and uh, further cause transcription of interleukin-2 and other cytokines. You also have uh, the uh, signal, uh, the clonal uh, expansion, wherein the interleukin-2, which is the newly synthesized interleukin-2 and cytokine, will uh, cause, uh, like they will bind in an autocrine fashion and they will cause uh, cell proliferation. This will ultimately result in cell-mediated uh, cytotoxicity and uh, secretion of uh, cytokines, chemokines, and various adhesion molecules, which will, again, uh, cause uh, graft inflammation. Uh, Ayanas? Yes, sir. Yeah, even Ayanas. here, instead of medical evaluation, a more appropriate thing in the box uh -huh. would have been mechanism or pathophysiology. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, yes. just for your teaching. Yes, sir. So, medical evaluation means you need to, in the bottom boxes, you must say what tests you do to evaluate. But here, what you're describing is the mechanism, mechanism. of acute rejection. rejection. Okay, so yes. that's what you should write. Okay, please go. Yes, yes. Uh, further, uh, you have the uh, like in terms of uh, talking about uh, cellular rejection, you have the incidence, which is uh, approximately uh, ten to thirty percent of uh, uh, cases of T-cell mediated uh, rejection have been uh, re uh, reported in the liver transplant patients. Uh, the risk factors, uh, in the recipient risk factors will include uh, uh, an, a recipient age of more than 55 years or uh, if the optimal therapeutic levels of uh, your immunosuppressive drugs like cyclosporin or tacrolimus are not given. In case of uh, prolonged uh, cold ischemia time, this is also one of the factors which uh, can result in uh, the manifestation of acute rejection. Uh, the protective river uh, factors, In there are some studies which uh, suggest that aspirin is considered to be a protective factor uh, because of its anti-inflammatory pro property. And uh, living related donor liver transplantation is associated with relatively less levels of uh, rejection. Uh, the clinical uh, presentation will uh, usually occur within uh, three to six months after liver transplantation. And uh, it, uh, in usually, uh, and in some cases, acute rejection can uh, manifest after 12 months post-transplant. This will usually occur in case of uh, medication non-compliance. And uh, the patients may present with fever, uh, malaise, abdominal pain, hepatosplenia, megaly, and rarely ascites. Uh, you will have your uh, laboratory uh, investigations, which will confirm uh, that is the abnormal uh, liver function test, which includes your ALT, AST, and GGT levels. Again, uh, the Im imaging findings will uh, help in uh, assessing the acute liver failure. Uh, then, uh, uh, like uh, in terms of uh, management, you will be aiming at optimizing the uh, uh, immunosuppression drugs and uh, uh, in terms of the giving pro appropriate doses of tacrolimus, mycophenolate, and uh, uh, cyclosporins as well. And uh, you will also uh, c consider uh, giving uh, like uh, optimal doses of glucocorticoids and uh, glucocor uh, management of uh, glucocorticoid-related toxicities uh, essential as well in order to prevent uh, Acute rejection of uh, uh, the uh, liver trans uh, in liver transplant candidates. Uh, going to uh, the long term manifestations, uh, which uh, the complications which usually occur in patients will uh, include uh, immunosuppression complications, which will be in terms of uh, infection, uh, which will include a variety of uh, uh, bacterial, fungal, and viral infections, and. Uh, here in the patient, uh, there can also be manifestations of uh, metabolic syndrome wherein uh, uh, because of uh, uh, the patients will develop uh, hypertension, uh, diabetes, obesity, dyslipidemia. Uh, it, this can also be because of the glucocorticoids and other uh, immunosuppressive drugs which have been administered. Uh, 
uh, then uh, uh, again, patients can have a manifestation of uh, acute kidney disease or a uh, chronic kidney disease as well. Uh, metabolic bone disorders is again, uh, uh, bone loss is an important uh, uh, complication which is seen in liver transplant uh, recipients. Uh, and they may, uh, you need to keep on assessing them for uh, osteopenia or osteoporosis. And uh, furthermore, uh, there can be uh, neurological complications uh, which can include uh, immunosuppressive associated uh, encephalopathy and uh, other metabolic abnormalities. Uh, patients can have uh, hepatobiliary complications as well. This will include uh, biliary adverse effects like uh, uh, post-transplantation strictures and leak. And uh, acute on, uh, chronic rejection can also be seen. And uh, there will be a recurrence of uh, primary liver disease as well. Uh, additional issues will include most of the patients having a complaint of uh, fatigue and decrease in the uh, health related quality, like the quality of life will be decreased. And some patients can, uh, like uh, amenorrhea and decreased uh, fertility, is a common occurrence among uh, female patients uh, post transplantation, like uh, in as a long term manifestation. Uh, going uh, to the programs which are uh, available, uh, like India has follows the uh, National Organ Transplant Program, wherein it has uh, three uh, designated uh, uh, levels. Which are which, the first is the uh, uh, National Organ and Tissue Transplant Organization. Uh, the other one, uh, the next level which we have is the uh, uh, the uh, Regional Organ and Tissue or uh, Transplantation. The Third uh, is the state organ and tissue transplant organizations. And uh, in Karnataka, we uh, the state uh, organ and tissue transplantation organization is uh, uh, the, uh, as mentioned, uh, Jiva Sartha, uh, which is the uh, organization which is being uh, seen in uh, Karnataka. Uh, they, the NOTO has set guidelines uh, de depending on the, uh, like, how to, uh, go about the allocation, how to uh, how the liver should be retrieved, and what are the guidelines which are supposed to be uh, followed for living donors as well as uh, diseased donors. Uh, so basically, uh, the patient needs to be registered uh, through by the concerned hospital through the online registration. And uh, you they uh, patients with uh, decompensated uh, liver cirrhosis should meet the standard like the MELT score criteria. And uh, again, you will, uh, there, there's a system of super urgent listing which can be done in case of uh, if there is a no primary non function of the liver allograph. If uh, the, there's a living uh, liver donor who has developed a life threatening liver failure, early, uh, the hepatic uh, artery thrombosis in case of retransplant, uh, uh, who are needing retransplant, all of these are considered to be an urgent listing. And contraindications again are the same of as mentioned before, MELT score of less than 15, severe cardiopulmonary distress, and uh, AIDS and uh, 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 uncontrolled sepsis. Uh, the allo uh, furthermore, the allocation principles will be done first based on the state waiting list. If no recipient is eligible in the state waiting list, then uh, they it will go to the nearby state in the uh, the ROTO, that is the Regional Organ and Tissue Transplant Organization. And uh, usually, uh, blood group O liver will be allocated to recipients with group O blood group and then to any other blood group. Other than O blood group, uh, if there is A, B or AB blood group, then they will be preferably allocated uh, to the same blood group. Uh, and if uh, it is not matched, then uh, finally it will go to the AB blood group. Uh, you will again check the blood group and age of the available donor. If you'll check on the uh, if, if this candidate belongs to the super urgent list criteria, and if not, uh, then further you will go ahead with the liver retrieval hospital, which can be a government or private hospital. Uh, the order in which it will be allocated is including the government hospitals by rotation followed by army hospitals and if there are no takers in those hospitals then it goes to the uh, private hospitals as per rota and uh, the liver retrieved from a private hospital uh, the, that is for if the liver is retrieved from a government hospital and if the liver is retrieved from a private hospital you will be uh, allocating it again to a rota of private hospitals if no 
take us in the private hospital then that will be offered to the government hospital and then uh, the last will be the uh, army hospital these are the few guidelines which are being stated as of now in the uh, allocation system uh, that's all sir rajiv final comments before we uh, i think uh, rajiv living donor it is a living related and non related also can be hello ah uh, final yes, sir. final comment i think i think she did a good job excellent i, say, I think kindness you know i mean um, the topic was very extensive but i think she did a good job, good job covering most of the indications contraindications and a few of the new aspects and also about allocation policy um i have put some guidelines you know with the yeah. european association of study of liver guidelines the chat box and also a link to the toronto video atlas you know which will give some uh, got some really good videos on it's all free to download and see videos on transplant techniques um i think i think uh, i think i think that should be enough sir for the exams yeah. and things and for them yeah. to have a, you know for them to kindle their interest in liver transplant surgery and medicine i mean what i'd like to say is you know there is a lot of medicine in the surgical aspect of liver transplant i remember my boss when i told him i wanted to do liver transplant he told me that i need to learn hepatology first so i think it is one aspect of surgery which brings out the physician in you so i would encourage people to get interested in liver and uh, you know if there are any questions you can call me or ask me now or i'll be very happy to answer is a living donor it is a living related or non related also can be done rajiv hello hello rajiv is not there he is probably left uh, lakshman sir uh, final yeah. comments no very well done ines i think it's an important topic for us to know about um, altogether very informative talk thank you Srikant, final talk, final talk. Excellent, excellent presentation. Very difficult to follow and I have to read it again and again. Uh, excellent, Sanya. excellent, Ainas. Very good. Thank you. It's a very Sanya. good presentation, sir. Very detailed, everything. Learned a lot today. Uh, I, I have to say, I, I learned a lot. I think what uh, Ainas has specialized is that she is able to put up the bullet points and speak. very you know fluidly in a very uh, is one good manner and explain the uh, the slides very well i think she has already picked up that art which is very Fantastic. good and i think the transplant is a very difficult topic and she did an excellent job on that thank you very much ainas and i think thank you dr rajiv lochan also yeah. for a very good moderation and giving us a lot of uh, information on the the you know the minutia and the technicalities of liver transplant thank you very much rajiv, rajiv is still rajiv is still there rajiv yes sir living, living donor is a related donor or non related also can give sir in india and we classify the law human organ transplant act classifies donors as near relatives and non near relatives unrelated donors are included in non near relatives although the law does not specify it is first degree relatives are father mother spouse children grandfather grandmother brother sister everybody else is a non near relative but for the court or the authorization committee to accept a non near relative the rigor of proof that there is no other near relative who can donate number 1 and number 2 transplant is not happening for uh, money Financial, should yeah. be should be should be proven so for example sushma suraj got a donor from a non near relative you know uh, that was that's very well documented it became a big controversy and whereas lot of other people have uh, had their own second degree relatives rejected so the law is a bit very unclear on that but most i mean the second thing which i have to say that you know most liver transplant units would not accept an unrelated donor which yeah. is obviously unrelated we would not accept it mainly because the problems after transplant you know for example the donor going and saying that you know i was offered so and so but i was only offered this and then there being a case started and all that people don't consider that to be really that worthwhile so most transplant programs would not accept a uh, unrelated donor uh, rajiv if the match is very good in uh, do liver related donors 
how long do they need to take the anti rejection medication is it lifelong or is it only 6 months or so no sir even yeah. if uh, even if the hla match first of all we don't do hla match for liver livers yeah. and even if it's a full match uh, some korean and japanese programs do that even if it's a full match it is lifelong immunosuppression yeah. it might be at a very low dose low but dose. immunosuppression yeah. is lifelong currently yeah okay yeah. Rajiv, thank you very much. Thank very nice much. of you to have spent time with us. Yeah. Thank you very much. Small, Not small problem. curiosity, sir. Yes, sir. Recently, thank the you, donor sir. expired. No donating liver. What is the cause? Sir, Pepsi. actually, to be honest, we don't know what the exact cause is. It happened in another hospital. Although I have been in discussions with the uh, team. I mean, they are devastated, and uh, of course, we all are. Um, my presumption is that it is probably a vascular cause, but not knowing what exactly 100% transpired it's a bit difficult to say but certainly she developed very rapidly progressive liver failure after discharge from hospital so most likely some type of vascular issue yeah okay yes sir thank you very much everybody thank and, you thank uh, you very much thank you thank sir you. thank you for having me good night sir well done ainas all the very best thanks